Well, it's a pleasure today to be able to introduce to you uh, Raymond Neutra. I have known Raymond for quite a while uh, because of my role at Cal Poly Pomona as Dean of the College of Environmental Design there. And I was involved as a department head of architecture when your mother made the generous decision to donate the Neutra family home to Cal Poly Pomona. So I was there at the beginning, which uh, then eventually becoming dean meant that I had the responsibility because it was a, a donation in life estate, which meant that for a period of about really six years, seven years, um, it meant that quarterly I met with Mrs. Neutra in the house just to see if things needed to be done or what we could be doing in Cal Poly to help which meant there were these wonderful sessions that I remember sitting up in the pavilion at the roof, um, talking about architecture mm. and talking about her love letters, which were to, or to Richard's love letters to her, which were really more like seminars in architecture. I've often said that if I wrote my wife a letter like that, I'd get banged on the side of the head. <laughs> um, and then these wonderful cello, <coughs> spring cello concerts that she would give, inviting all of her friends memories uh, that are in my family because I used to bring my son and daughter along to those concerts and now my daughter is an architect in, in Chicago so who knows maybe the influence was uh, from there. So I've known uh, uh, Raymond and Dion, his brother, for some time um, and uh, uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to introduce him here to you at part of the seminar and I'm going to work from uh, program sheets because it's always better uh, to, to hear the, the story that way. Stimulated by his father's 1954 book, Survival Through Design, as an aside, it should be required for reading for all design students. That's just my opinion. Raymond Neutra made his career in medicine and environmental epidemiology. He taught at Harvard and UCLA before joining the California Department of Public Health to head up the Division of Environmental and Occupational Disease Control. Uh, he's going to talk about the roots of his father's biorealistic bio approach to architecture and the ways he integrated his environments with nature. Uh, Raymond, Dr. Neutra, serves on the ethics and on the policy committees of ISEE. He is helping to fund raise for the Richard and Dion Neutra VDL studio residences. This was designed by his late father, architect Richard Neutra, and his brother, Dion. In 1990, it was left to Cal Poly Pomona College of Environmental Design. He and his wife have volunteered with the Royal Institute of Health Sciences in Bhutan. He is developing a course on decision-making for undergraduates and has been writing and publishing essays on a number of topics, including the experiences of the unsung public health heroes who keep us healthy. Chief of the Division of Environmental and Occupational Disease Control, DEODC, after 27 years at the California Department of Public Health, CDPH, DEODC included the Childhood Lead Poisoning, Lead Poisoning Prevention Branch, the California Occupational Health Branch, the Environmental Health Laboratory Branch, the California Birth Defects Registry, and the Environmental Health Investigations Branch. This division of 200 people is responsible for conducting investigations and providing technical assistance and advice to state and county officials with regard to occupational and environmental problems. Dr. Neutro is also chief of the Electric Magnetic Fields Program, a multi-year study of policy-related research. This program included projects that evaluated precautionary actions at schools and along power lines from both ethical and cost-effectiveness point of view. Prior to accepting his position as division chief, Dr. Neutra worked for 15 years developing an environmental health investigations capacity, serving as section chief and then as a branch chief. Before joining CDHS in 1980, he was a tenured associate professor of epidemiology at the UCLA Medical School and the School of Public Health, and an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School and the School of Public Health. He carried out epidemiology research and Cali, Columbia, South America for three years and was medical officer for the Indian Health Service on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico. He received his bachelor's degree from Pomona College, his medical degree from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, 
and his master's and doctorate degrees in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. He speaks Spanish, French, and German. Dr. Neutra is a board certified, is board certified in preventive medicine. He is co-author of a textbook on clinical quantitative decision analysis and a medical anthropological book on seizures among the Navajo. He has published more than 100 scientific articles or book chapters. These reveal a particular interest in reproductive epidemiology, disease clusters, electric and magnetic fields, the application of epidemiology to quantitative decision making and the relevance of ethical framework, frameworks and public <coughs> participation to the formation of environmental health policy. He's been president of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology, from which he received the John Goldsmith Award for Career Achievement. He has served on the scientific advisory boards of the National Institutes of Health, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registries, and the World, World Health Organization, where he chaired a workshop on precautionary principle. He has been on the editorial boards of Epidemiology, Annals, Annals of Environmental Health, Human and Ecological Risk Assessment, and Environmental Health as an online journal. Uh, what an amazing career he brings to the table. Um, what an amazing knowledge he brings from first firsthand experience of architecture and the practice which today, even today, inspires us in the areas of research and thinking differently about how you do architecture. So Raymond, welcome. It's great thank to you. have you with us. Norman, thank you. <laughs> About the time that I was retiring uh, a decade ago, uh, the then Dean of Cal Poly, uh, Pomona, came and asked my help for the restoration of the place where I had grown up, which was a live work space where uh, the little office there was where most of my dad's uh, projects had been designed. The, um, and um, that sort of brought me back uh, to the world of architecture, having been away in, in environmental health and medicine. Um, <clears throat> we were successful in getting the uh, Neutra VDL studio and residences uh, restored, and uh, uh, thanks to Professor Sarah Lawrence and her husband, uh, David Hartwell, who've been there for nearly a decade. The place is really looking good and has an interesting program going on. There's a course that uh, is open to Cal Poly uh, architecture students where they study my dad's work and that place. And then they develop a docents tour and uh, in order to get class credit, they have to come out and be a docent for uh, four Saturdays. Uh, uh, during the year, and so they get a chance to talk to lay people about architecture. And, and so there's a couple of thousand people that go through that place now uh, every Saturday. And if you're in LA between 11 and 3, uh, some Saturday, some bright young Cal Poly student will take you around and explain the place to you. Uh, one of the things that I did was to, uh, do the laborious documentation that was necessary to qualify the place as a National Historic Landmark. And uh, Representative Adam Schiff from that area, who you may have heard about in the news uh, intermittently uh, these days, came and unveiled the, the uh, plaque as, uh, a year ago uh, as a National Historic Landmark. And that got me into uh, uh, I thought, well, I can, I was quite involved with my, my dad as a, as a, I'm the youngest in the family. My brother Dion is 12 years older than I am. So by the time I was 10, he was 22. So effectively I was an only child. And because the office was in the house uh, and I would uh, drift through the office and see the guys on their, metal stools with the back in the day of triangles and T-squares and, and even had a somewhat unsuccessful attempt to get the Russian architect Sergei Kushin to teach me how to draft. 
Um, so I knew about who my dad was working with, and, and in the evenings I would uh, eavesdrop uh, around the corner in the second floor living room when the clients would come and be interviewed. So I knew who he was doing it from and for, and and uh, uh, go on uh, Saturday tours to ins inspect projects underway and so forth. So I was kind of submerged in this stuff. And uh, I thought, well, it'd be easy to do this documentation. But I found myself going back beyond the textbooks and uh, summary books that I knew to some of the original publications. And uh, as you'll see, it gives a little bit different perspective when you, you see how these buildings, the rhetoric of presenting these buildings in 19. 30 and 1934 and so forth. So I ended up uh, doing that documentation and what happened to that book that was going around? Hold that up. So uh, I ended up even writing a book, uh, which I'll tell you about, Cheap and Thin, Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's how an environmental epidemiologist gets to come to the new school of architecture and talk to you about architecture. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the biorealistic approach and its roots, uh, the importance of economic, economical means and social justice in my dad's work, uh, experimenting with openness at home, at that place that I grew up with, using the outdoors, and then we'll talk a little bit about technology of the evolution of sliding doors, and uh, talk about the phenomenology of indoor-outdoor architecture, and then a little pessimistic <coughs> riff about what to do when the outdoors is hostile, as it's starting to become. Um, I gave a version of this talk at I IIT, and here's my mom and niece uh, at an earlier time, and, and a lecture uh, there probably sometime in the 50s. Uh, so what were the commitments? It was an approach to design that's aiming at flourishing using economic means, nature, and evidence. Uh, so supplementing intuition with uh, uh, evidence. And there were lots of books that my dad wrote about these. Uh, early on, he came across a book on physiological psychology by Wilhelm Wundt that influenced him a lot. And in those love letters, he's talking about uh, phenomenology to his uh, soon-to-be wife. And, and some of these ideas of the early German physiological psychologists. And he was also influenced by the realism of people like Emil Zola. So biorealism uh, was this neologism that he coined. Adolf Loos, uh, this is Loos's uh, Miller house outside of Prague, uh, was running a evening seminar at a cafe in, in Vienna, and my dad and Rudolf Schindler attended. Uh, and uh, Loos was the one who had written this article, Ornament in Crime, uh, and saying that uh, people with uh, any educated person with a, uh, with a tattoo on him was um, either in jail for having committed murder or, or about to do so. Um, so he was against uh, uh, ornament, but he also was very committed to architecture as a profession and not an art. He said that only in design tombstones was an architect and an artist, and he had a responsibility to his clients. And that was something that resonated with my father a lot. Loos had been in the United States uh, in, in the, uh, in the 90, 1890s, and um, he was an enthusiast about the new 
immigrant Americans. He was astounded in New York City that there were people who back in Europe were cutting each other's throats and were perfectly happy to live together and, and uh, were open to do new things. And of course, my father had discovered right and knew about Sullivan. And so he wanted to somehow meet them and get to work with them. But he also was one of these people who had discovered Henry Ford and he wanted to know about American know-how. So he did indeed meet uh, a Sullivan, whose book, The Kindergarten Chats, uh, uh, he was trying to get published in, in Germany. And at the funeral of, of Sullivan, he finally met Wright face to face, who he had been uh, um, corresponding with for a number of years, hoping to get to Japan to work on the Imperial Hotel. And of course, he admired this uh, work of, of uh, Sullivan. And, um, but then he was able to go for about half a year and uh, work for Wright. And while he was there, his former employer, Eric Mendelssohn, showed up to encourage uh, Wright to cooperate with the publication by the Dutchman Weidefeld. And uh, uh, my father served as the interpreter between the two of them. And um, Werner Moser, uh, um, who was a Swiss architect and his wife, sat there biting their tongue because both of the men had sharp uh, tongues about their uh, attitudes to each other's work and my father was busily uh, sort of softening the conversation in, in translation so that he claimed that the two of uh, Mendelssohn and Wright became friends after that. Um, so this was the Wright that my father uh, was enthusiastic about, 1902 unbuilt project or this, the 1908 Gale House. Um, it was right in his period where he was coming to terms with the machine. Uh, he was exploding the box. He was reaching out into nature. And uh, my father poured over the Vosmuth portfolio and, uh, when he got to Chicago, visited all of these places in Oak Park in Chicago. But as I said, uh, he was, he had lived through World War I in the Austrian army uh, hauling a artillery piece with horses around Bosnia and Herzegovina and Albania. And he was of that generation that saw the collapse of the, of, of, um, um, the emperor of Austria, the Kaiser of Germany, the um, Tsar of Russia, and um, there were all kinds of socialist and communist experiments afoot. And uh, he had been very much influenced by the uh, Austrian Socialist Party, which was one of the strongest uh, socialist parties, it would have had a international meeting, but for the assassination of the Archduke of um, Austria uh, a few months before. So he knew all about Henry Ford, who was able to, with factory technology make what used to be a, a luxury item available to anybody. And he thought that uh, for this clientele who were living in slums, who had never been thought about by architects, that this would be the solution uh, for them. And so uh, he wrote this book in 1926, uh, which said, from now on, architects are just going to be assembling uh, industrially produced elements off of uh, Swede's catalog, um, and, and that will be the future of architecture. And he wanted to avoid the conspicuous <coughs> consumption of space, materials, craftsmanship, and historic reference. And of course, Neuschwanstein built in the 1870s to look like something from 1200 uh, is the epitome of just the opposite of that. He was also, like the Bauhaus people, uh, saying that we need to come to a kind of beauty that doesn't uh, depend on the Victorian accumulation of lots of stuff. 
So this was a an acceptance of the arts and crafts idea that an appreciation of beauty was important, but how can you do it without with a greater simplicity? Uh, and so uh, his answer uh, was uh, the Lovell Health House started the design started in 1927. The uh, contractors were finally assembled, subcontractors were assembled by the beginning of 1929. And my dad served as the general contractor to do this building. And uh, this got him into the 1932 Modern Architecture Exhibition at, at MoMA, which enraged his former boss, Frank Lloyd Wright, who characterized it as cheap and thin, hence the title of this book, um, which is available to you for $3 on, on Amazon as a Kindle book, or for about 60 bucks from Blurb with, with 90 color photographs. But uh, Wright was on to something in a way because my father was trying, continuously trying to be economic and trying to be light uh, and, and prefabricated while Wright tended to be more massive and opulent. So uh, then in the 30s, there were a series of experimental uh, uh, buildings built for individual clients, but with the idea that maybe these would be case studies for uh, low cost housing. This, this was a, uh, a building built out of uh, steel panels and the uh, heating and cooling air was supposed to go through these channels uh, for this house for a historian, Mr. Beard, who was a professor at Caltech. And, this was a steel and um, um, plywood house that was built on one location and then disassembled and re put together uh, near UCLA and was bought by the architect Maynard Linden, who had a great career in school architecture and designed the Ralph Bunch building on, on the campus there. And then later, uh, Bill Bryce, who is the uh, art professor uh, uh, bought the house in the early 50s, I think, and the family has owned it since. There were um, experiments with apartment uh, designs, uh, public housing uh, for dock workers in the early 40s, uh, with uh, furniture that they could make in the local uh, wood shop. Uh, this uh, is Avion Village outside of Dallas, uh, Texas. And a few years ago, my wife Peggy and I decided that we would go and see if it was still there and discovered to our astonishment in the bowels of conservative Texas that this is a, this is a cooperative. And for $400 a month, you can have a two bedroom apartment with the electricity and access to the Central Park and a in a, um, in, a, um, in a clubhouse and it, it was prefabricated for uh, aviation workers in a near, nearby factory. The thing was that right after the depression, nobody had any equity to buy houses, but these people had good salaries. So uh, the idea was to have a cooperative and uh, it was sort of a lag in the two mortgages so that people would pay a monthly fee and, and be able to afford these little houses that were prefabricated. And the first day they had a race to see who could finish first. The winner finished in 59 minutes and this lady took a bath in minute 60. It was in the paper and in large magazine. So here it is uh, to this day. Um, some, some of the grandchildren of the original workers still uh, live in those houses and they cannot be speculated on. They have to be, you can buy one for the original cost plus the accumulated 70 years of cost of living uh, increases. Another thing was uh, 
uh, an idea of this prefabricated metal ring plan school with sliding doors or folding accordion doors opening into garden uh, plots. And this was influenced by uh, his original client, Mrs. Lovell, because the Lovell house is really a house and school in one and was raised in 1930 was, was published as such. And for about a decade, there was a progressive school influenced by the John Dewey ideas. And so this was a building that anticipated a, an attitude to instruction that uh, was anathema to the idea of little kids sitting in rows being uh, absorbing information that was being poured into them. They were supposed to be out doing projects outside and wandering from classroom to classroom. We'll come back to this a little bit. There were also uh, furniture designs. This is that housing project chair, which you can now get for $800 from a, a German uh, school uh, furniture company that is now making Notre furniture. And my dad even designed an aluminum bus in 1930 for Philip Johnson's father, who was affiliated with that company. So the Lovell Health House does not have a radical indoor-outdoor uh, linkage, but the next building, which was my father's own studio and residence, did. And as it was completed, uh, this it's very hard to see the whole thing now, so this model gives you the idea that this is on a 60 by 70 foot lot. And, uh, and during my childhood, we lived there. Um, Frank Wilkinson, who started public housing in Los Angeles, lived on the top floor. The bottom floor had the office and a, um, a spinster lady who rented a room. So there were three households in a small office all in a 60 by 70 foot lot. Uh, with 12 exits. So unlike uh, Schindler's uh, King's Road house, which had a sort of communal idea, the whole point here was, and maybe in reaction to uh, being all that close to the other people at King's Road, that this place really uh, allows all this to be going on without interfering uh, between the people. And it was only made possible by this guy. Uh, in 1930, when my father took a trip to uh, Europe uh, after finishing the Lovell Health House and after the 1929 crash when there basically was no architecture to be built, uh, he wanted to go to the third uh, Congress Internationale de Architecture Moderne, uh, SIAM, that was going to be in Brussels. And uh, uh, he, he gave lectures in Zurich, he gave lectures in Vienna and in Stuttgart. And uh, he got a telegram from somebody in Holland saying, I'm coming to Switzerland and I hear that you're in Switzerland. Is there some way we could rendezvous? Case van der Leo. So my father assumed that this was some kind of journalist who wanted to talk to him and he agreed to meet with him in Basel. And he came down uh, from the apartment with my mother at the appointed time. And there was a giant Packard limousine with a chauffeur and this guy in the back uh, who was on his way to a League of Nations uh, work, uh, work life conference of which he was the president because he had recently designed this factory, the Fanella factory, or rather he had had it designed by uh, van der Flucht and Brinkmann. And so he said, "You, I've read your book about America and you must absolutely come and I'll set up lectures in Holland for you. And you, you can stay with Wiegfeld in the, uh, in the Schroeder house and you can meet uh, van der Flucht and you can meet Diker and, and um, uh, all these people and, uh, and stay at my house that Van der Flucht had designed. So this was an incredible thing. And my father came across then 
other enthusiasts of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, uh, particularly Biker and Thunderflow, where, where there was kind of a, a, a way of doing right without the repetitive decorations and in new technology. Uh, so when he came back uh, to the States, he worked on this aluminum bus and then finally got back to Los Angeles and there really was no work. But Fonder Leo um, telegraphed again and said, I'm coming out to Los Angeles to give some lectures about uh, a factory design and so forth. And I'd like to see what you're doing. And so he came out, my father took him all around Los Angeles, showed him the Lovell Health House, showed him a, a reinforced concrete apartment house that he and Schindler had done, probably introduced him to Schindler and showed him Hollyhock and different things. And at the end, uh, Founder Leo said, uh, well, what about your house? And my father said, well, I just rent a bungalow. I don't have the money for a house. And Founder Leo pulled out a checkbook and a pen and said, how much do you need? <coughs> so with that, my parents uh, were able to demonstrate in a small house what kind of progressive materials are available price-wise and that such a small dwelling need not be uncomfortable or have a hospital-like atmosphere. In this manner, we will acquire a house and an office designed by Richard where he can demonstrate his ideas. And so this is what it looked like in 1932. And uh, uh, it includes a number of features that would appear again and again in his architecture. It was a second, it was a two-story building on just part of the lot so that they would be able to capture and borrow the view of Silver Lake in the, in the hills beyond. It has these prairie style overhangs to, and, and it had actually um, crank down awnings built into the overhang. Uh, you can see the shiny silver uh, trim there, which he picked up from the Dutch, where the idea was that instead of seeing the pole there in its entirety, you're seeing the highlight of the pole. So it is thinner and, and, and disappears. And my father's, to me, rather uh, impractical romance with the transparent front door, which shows up again and again. Um, I'll come back. Oh, then one of the features uh, in the top floor of the house was the adoption of a standard uh, off of the uh, of uh, Sweet's catalog accordion door that uh, opened the small living room out into a functional balcony. Um, and this was a door that usually was used in the garage doors of gasoline stations, but was adopted for, um, for residential use. Uh, there was a rooftop a garden, and you can see my now 92 year old brother Dion and my mother sitting there enjoying this lake that, if it was a one story building, you never would have been able to enjoy. Um, one of the characteristics of the way this place was presented were these photographs, and, and unlike other photographs of the early 20s, even in Frank Lloyd Wright's building, uh, interior photographs. Uh, exposed for the interior and so what's outside gets washed out. And my father was very careful to show that, uh, you know, what you were seeing out of those windows because this came for free. It's the answer. If you don't have lots of stuff, at least you have this beautiful view. Um, and although it looks kind of severe, uh, some of the few, because this particular building, this part of the building burned down in 1963 and my father and brother Lee uh, designed it on the same prefabricated foundation. Um, but so there's not so many color photographs of what this place looked like and how I remember it as a kid. Um, there was a lot of leather, there was um, 
waxed masonite uh, paneling, um, warm rug, so that the the impression indeed is not hospital-like, as opposed to the Villa Savoy, which is kind of uh, hospital-like, uh, built around the same time. The other thing that was unique about the way this house was presented was the emphasis on night illumination. Some of the things that you see, for example, uh, Lesquez's uh, house in, in uh, New York, you see the house from outside glowing, but you don't see much attention to what this place is going to feel like at night. And so these, uh, and here is one of the 15 pages in the architectural form that, for this little house that, uh, in 1935. Uh, uses of mirrors to expand space. Then when I was born, another wing was uh, created that you saw in that model, and that created two patios. And this is the home magazine uh, uh, publicizing this thing with an enormous uh, sliding glass door. You see that strip lighting on the outside that served both to illuminate the vegetation outside the window and also to cast uh, reflections on the outside so that you didn't see inside so much. And here's what it looks like today. Uh, it would open up completely into this little patio and that table there is a nitro designed camel table that could become a dining table or a, or a cocktail table and we would have our meals there. Another room in that garden place had a garage door. On the plans, it was supposed to be a garage because it was just a, a foot or two away from the sidewalk, but no sooner did the building inspector sign off on the thing that the Eugenia hedges were planted in front of the garage. And my job as a nine-year-old taking people around the house was to come into this room and whack that door with my hip and this door would flip open and suddenly there was a garden uh, right there. So many different ways to open from the indoors to the outdoors. Because my dad was obsessive about uh, um, making use of every square inch. If there was anything more sinful than a pitched roof, in our family, it was having a front lawn that was used for absolutely nothing. And uh, so this, this article in Sunset Magazine about the index of livability of what <coughs> fraction of the cubic uh, space was really usable in this, in this thing. So uh, the idea of the garages got exported to the regional uh, schools of Puerto Rico and this school is still in use 43 years later. I'm, I'm not sure how well it did in the, in the hurricane that was there, but since it's reinforced concrete, probably okay. Uh, the ideas about 1926 school finally were realized in the 1934 Corona Avenue School. And once again, you see the uh, uh, children sitting around outside the big sliding glass doors. And if you zoomed in on this picture, you would see a head uh, in, uh, in the inside of the, of the uh, uh, photo, which was me, uh, a teenager made to sit down by Julius Schulman so I wasn't out of place in this picture. Now the, the other teachers were kind of giggling in the background because they never used this space the way uh, it's depicted in this um, in this picture uh, because that uh, the LA Unified School District was not operating on a John Dewey approach to it. So of the eight schools that my father designed, it's really only this one uh, designed by Nitra and Alexander on the UCLA campus, uh, which really uses the building the way it was supposed to be. Uh, which, which tells you something that my, my dad was having a program that was a radical program that rubbed against the grain of how schools really were used, 
But when you had a client like Mrs. Seeds, who was the principal and who wanted to do this, these kids really do uh, projects in and out. They're wandering between classrooms and it's all perfectly okay because that's how they run the school. Um, another one of these schools at Aliso Village in a public housing uh, project in LA. Uh, this is another school uh, with a uh, now a hatch that goes up and down uh, and allows um, theatrical performances out the back or to the front. We recently destroyed uh, Gettysburg uh, Visitor Center. Uh, it's another example of the architect trying to foist a program that the, uh, was rubbing against the grain. Uh, when my father got this assignment, he happened to be driving around Texas with a southerner, southerner and when the Southerner heard that there was going to be a Gettysburg uh, Visitor Center, he said, well, this is just a celebration of the defeat of the Confederacy. And so my father thought, well, uh, maybe he would try to build in a facility uh, like this little pulpit there on the side where on the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, there would be an address about the angels of our better spirits and peace and, and um, you know, government for the people, by the people, and so forth. Well, that really never took. And the people who uh, like to come and see the diorama of the battle and put on gray and blue uniforms and were irritated by this modernist abomination on their line of sight were successful and it was turned down. Uh, another example of indoor-outdoor uh, is the uh, Orange County Drive-In Church. Uh, and this is the pulpit where uh, uh, Robert Schuler would walk out onto the pulpit and he could either talk to the thousands of people parked in their cars with the little microphones listening to him or turn around and talk to the people inside. So there was this big um, uh, sliding glass wall that allowed that kind of function to happen. And here's the... Uh, um, uh, a house where you have complete openness from the back into a pool and, and front patio and mom is sitting uh, there. A kind of uh, indoor outdoors that is uniquely possible in certain parts of the world, one of which is California, and that's why my father came to California. Interestingly enough, in Northern Italy, you could do this too, and I asked, uh, Sarah Robinson, why in her new house she wasn't doing this, and she said, well, there are too many robbers. You have to have bars on everything to come in. So in the late 1950s, there were neither mosquitoes nor robbers, and it was possible to do this. So I got intrigued by something that I had never noticed before I did this research uh, about my dad, which was that uh, in that picture of uh, the Villa Savoy, you really have floor-to-ceiling glass. And of course, in, in the uh, 1929 uh, Barcelona Pavilion, which of course isn't really, and nobody lived in there, but there's floor-to-ceiling glass. And my father never really did floor-to-ceiling glass until the late 40s. And in particular, uh, as you'll see, the sliding glass doors always had a rather high kick plate that lined up with the lines of the windows. And I assumed that there had been a technological change because of World War II that allowed this to happen. And as you'll see, that isn't true. So, of course, the Japanese have sliding shoji screens and uh, there's no barbecues out there. This is, uh, you sit there and you contemplate uh, and meditate on the garden. Uh, probably the first modern house that really had a functional indoor outdoor thing is, Ju is Rudolf Schindler's King's Road House. How many of you have been to that? 
Oh, you got to go, got to go. Um, uh, so, but these were not glass doors. This was a very low budget thing. These were, these were canvas doors and the technology was basically like a closet door. They were just sliding on, I, I think maybe even wooden sliders originally. Uh, in 1930, Le Corbusier has this enormous glass door which is cranked open uh, at the Villa Savoy. And as I say, very thin frame, floor to ceiling glass that actually um, Albert Fry uh, detailed for him when he was working in, in um, Le Corbusier's office. Um, then, of course, Mies at the Villa Tugenta has a bravura window that slides down into the basement. And once again, this is not functionally linking indoors and outdoors, it's just making a point. Um, um, architect Fuchs has done that a few years before in Brno at a coffee house where indeed people spilled in and out of the coffee house. My father first used sliding doors rather than that folding door uh, at that metal paneled house that I showed you earlier. And there's, there's uh, one at the foot of the stairs, and then there's another one that opens to a little patio, uh, which has sliding uh, screen doors. And these are top hung on elevator door hardware. Uh, but the door itself was a one-off door fabricated by a metal shop. And uh, these are the details of these things. They had little adjustable nuts on them to make sure that they were, that the door was, was uh, square. And a similar methodology was used in a few years later in Palm Springs at the Miller House. Uh, and you can see that big kick plate there which is lining up with the window line. And it's opening on to a screen uh, um, porch that Mrs. Miller wanted to have because of her experience in St. Louis where there are lots of bugs. Um, and then here's the door closed. Uh, then in 1938 in uh, Westwood, uh, the series of apartments have a wooden door that is top hung. Uh, with this hardware. And then in 1942, you have the uh, Nesbitt house. And now this is the first time that he uses floor to ceiling glass with a little pool that goes from uh, um, outside and, and flows inside into the house to, to have this visual link. Uh, in some ways, not quite rational. You see the red front door and the current owner has wisely put a little pot there and so that people don't go banging into the door. And this is the interior of the house. And now you see the sliding glass doors, which are not floor to ceiling. Uh, they, they, now this kick plate is a little bit lower and once again lining up. And this door originally was a wooden door because this was 1942 and metal was hard to come by if people were gearing up for the war. And the person who drafted this was DM, 16 year old Dion Neutra, who was working after hours in, in high school, uh, helping out in the office. So, uh, um, th there are sliding glass doors on two of the eleva uh, adjacent elevations of this door. But then comes the 1946 Kaufman Desert House uh, with these uh, uh, windows that really read as being floor to ceiling. Uh, but as you see, not quite. And I had assumed that now this was the new technology. And this is a bravura kind of thing with two sliding doors that meet at the corner uh, of this living room. But it turns out that the genesis of this is something different. 
on February 19th, 1946, a mere two weeks after the contract was signed to design this house in Palm Springs, Edgar Kaufman drew, drove out to see the drawings and the standard form that my dad used for client comments says, uh, the owner has inspected the drawings as progressed to date and finds them complying with his wishes, except in the certain points where the following changes are ordered. And in my father's handwriting, it says, Hercules glass for sliding doors and meeting at the corner without styles. So Edward Kaufman was used to those swinging doors in front of, of, uh, of um, department stores where there were no styles in this very thick thing. And he had this idea that somehow these would roll together. And that the, uh, this was the best that my dad could do for Mr. Kaufman. Um, and indeed, uh, it was a one-off door, but it was hung on standard uh, grant pulley <coughs> hardware top hung doors and it turns out that the first generation of case study houses all had these top hung doors um, as indeed is this door at the Notre BDL with its big kick plate but after the Kaufman house you have doors like this and uh, uh, in 1947, in the Arts and Architecture, you see a seven-page-long uh, advertisement from the steel-built folks uh, saying that you can get either top-hung or bottom roller doors. And uh, Eames actually did have a bottom-rolling uh, industrial door uh, by the Truxon Company, which had been making doors, folding, and other doors like this since the 20s for factories. So uh, Eames also was assembling a house from elements off the shelf, but now in 1947 as opposed to 1927. Going backwards. So now we'll talk about the si sight, sound, smells, and feel uh, of the outdoors. Uh, my dad had started going back to neurology, his early interests in reading about brain science and phenomenology, and uh, uh, wrote finally was able to publish this in, in Survival Through Design. This is the 10th anniversary version to which I wrote an introduction as a young physician. Uh, and my father had this notion that uh, we are kind of like a layer cake. At the very top are the strawberries, which is the latest thing that you saw last week in Dwell Magazine or the Architectural Record. Uh, and at the bottom is a layer that was laid down for 100,000 years in this environment uh, when we were wandering around as hunter-gatherers. And that you ignored the realities of that layer to your peril while you could get away with going to something new with what was the latest thing at well. Now, an example of, of one of the things that my father felt instinctively was that the relationship between windows or sliding doors and the inside uh, can create this glare situation. And in fact, that's the usual way that sliding doors are deployed. And so he, uh, um, as much as possible, tried to run the windows up to the ceiling so that you spilled a lot of light on the ceiling and you have a gradual uh, um, gradation of intensity instead of this sharp contrast. And he was delighted when he found out that 
a researcher had actually studied what Blair did in schools and showed that it had an adverse effect. So it wasn't just a question of what he liked, but that there was a real impact of this. And this uh, played out in how he was now dealing with rooftops. Remember I showed you that picture of the rooftop garden in the 1932 BDL studio residences. Well, frankly, it never got used very much because it was just too sunny. I would go up there and throw dirt clods on the passing cars on occasion, but uh, basically it was just too hot to really be up there. And this is the Kaufman House uh, Gloria, which has this nice shaded uh, roof and even has these louvers, which uh, can be closed against the sun and the wind. And he picked this up in 1946 from a um, um, the Vire de Pinos apartment house designed by Hardoy um, in uh, the late 30s, which had wooden uh, uh, vertical louvers. And so my father adapted this design that had them so that they could lock. And uh, uh, this became an important feature in many of his buildings thereafter. And he wrote an article about sun uh, uh, protection in South America for, when he came back in 1946. Well, after the fire in the BDL, my brother Dion and my father had this opportunity to rebuild on the same uh, property. Once again, you see this bor borrowed landscape. You see the windows going all the way to the ceiling with the north exposure. Um, you, you have uh, a rooftop uh, pavilion now and a water roof on there, which uh, cast little ripples and light on the ceiling. And that's where Marvin used to meet with my mom and she would play in concert up there. He also paid a lot of attention to the inner ear sense and he tried to provide a really clear definition of what was horizontal and what was vertical. And that the experience that this little girl has of looking 10 feet across the room is different from these people uh, who are looking 10 feet up or people on the balcony of the VDL who are looking 10 feet down. Same distance, but a very different experience. The other thing that he emphasized a lot was what he called honeymoon moments, that uh, we experience architecture and remember it not as the average of every experience, but certain peak honeymoon experiences. So there's some cultures that learn to pay attention to that. Peggy and I were in Kyoto during cherry blossom time, and all these people know to come out and celebrate the blossoming of these uh, trees. And so he would say that this house in Switzerland, that first morning in May when you can open the sliding glass door is something that you remember for the rest of the year, even though there are many months where it has to remain closed. So what do you do if it's hostile? Uh, this is the progression of what the temperature in the world is gonna look like. The red is uh, Abu Dhabi now in July and uh, uh, a century from now, that's the direction we're going in. So you're going to have to deal with things differently. And if you're designing space stations, you don't want to have sliding glass doors there either. Uh, here's uh, my brother Dion uh, uh, explaining to my wife his design of the Huntington Beach uh, library where he's brought indoors the outdoor environment. So there's my main points there, and I'll stop there. Open for questions. Wow. I know your father was. Um, And actually, I mean, just an observation by your mother in one of our conversations about how empathetic he was, even about the smallest nuances of the homeowners or the user's experience of space. That he really began, even with the understanding 
the maybe the most idiosyncratic bathroom habits of the, of the right. You know, um, I had, uh, I was telling Marvin that there's a house in Pebble Beach that a well-to-do Iranian lady wants to tear down and build a McMansion. And uh, I realized that none of these houses are McMansions uh, because uh, they are responding to a fairly recent in, the, in human history phenomenon that someone who is a teacher at a high school could afford in the 1950s to hire my dad to design things. So uh, for those people, the purpose of the house was not to impress their well-to-do confreres as this Iranian tech hedge fund lady, you know, she's going to invite people down to Pebble Beach, and there's going to be a ceremonial stairway, and she will come down, and people will look up, and they will be very impressed the way in Versailles. So the idea that an architect would pay attention to where the toilet paper would be uh, was not something that was ever part of the architect's job prior to that. Um, and so this is a phenomenon, and the whole philosophy of these houses is that, that uh, once again, that it could be a beautiful experience because you were relying on nature to provide the decoration, and you didn't have to have lots of arts and craft, marquetry, uh, furniture, and so forth. So of course, this Iranian lady would not find this building to her liking because it doesn't respond to her program. Uh, so yes, there's early letters from my dad in 1922 writing to my mom and his future mother-in-law saying, I'm designing something for this English guy in Vienna, and here's the program. Shall we write each other about, you know, where we'll put the chairs and so forth? And, and uh, uh, well, yes, that's a good idea about the couch there, but how are some of the elderly <coughs> people going to get out of the couch if you have it like that? This kind of interest in what people do, how they socialize, what they, uh, what delights and inspires them, but also what impact to them that they don't even notice that is having an effect on them. And those are the kind of things that uh, Louis the Fourteenth was not so, wouldn't have been relevant. And you could argue that my father, in some of his busy, biggest things where people did have that program was not quite so successful because he had that, uh, he had a kind of a social background agenda to this whole thing that didn't fit certain kind of clients. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's been wonderful. Me and you, you know. I was educated in Mexico and uh, Richard Neutra uh, told me that they're important because of the weather that we have. And so the architecture of your father uh, is always um, uh, had a place in, 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 in Mexico. In my projects here, and this is a question for you, I always buy the Richard Neutra number for the houses. Is there any story that you can tell us about why they are so famous? Um, a house, uh, that, that company came to my brother and said, uh, can we do some Neutra style thing? And he advised them uh, on uh, producing that. And you, uh, I think the city of Boston now has has those on their, on their signs. And every once in a while in the movie, you'll see it. I I used it in this uh, Neutra font. You can get it on the on thing. I used it in this this book here, uh, cheap and thin. Uh, uh, Cath Professor Catherine Rose Edinger in Morelia is about to publish a book about my dad's, in Spanish, about my dad's impact in Latin America. He traveled there a lot, 
His first trip to um, Mexico City was to visit um, Diego and Frida Rivera and Mario Pani in, in 1937. Uh, he has a wonderful description of that visit. They went off to, uh, to see the pyramids together. And, and Frida put her hand on his thigh in the car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a controversial question. Fashion and nature and project together as partners. Right. And they lived for maybe 10 years. And then it was a blow up. Right. And, but a lot of the original ideas were together. There was a shared philosophy. So, so the question is, uh, Neutra and Schindler lived together for five years at, at, um, at King's Road, and then later there was a falling out. Um, it's, uh, Schindler was very important to my father. He, uh, they corresponded, my father would send him letters from Herzegovina while he was hauling these guns around. Uh, and he had wanted to come to the United States. Uh, Schindler got out in 1913 and, and now was working with the right. And, uh, and, and Schindler was very helpful in getting my father uh, writing affidavit. Pauline wrote an affidavit to my father. And uh, they were um, together. My father was, my father quickly got a license before Schindler did. And so he proposed to Schindler that they uh, work together. And uh, my father was much more of a get go getter than Schindler was. And they had all kinds of, of projects, including the, the, uh, a League of Nations project, which was actually suggested to my father by his mother-in-law, my mother's mother, who was in Switzerland. And so my father had been working for a historicist architect in downtown Los Angeles, and he quit to work on this thing and tried to get Schindler involved in the project. Schindler had other jobs, and, and my father was a, uh, a morning person and Schindler was an evening person and uh, it was hard to get Schindler to kind of focus on this project and if you go to UCLA there are tracing papers of their respective uh, drawings for this thing. There's one of them that shows how my father would have done it uh, but then Schindler uh, took over the part that faced the uh, Lake Geneva uh, with this very impressive uh, sort of overhanging kind of complex shape. The shape that my father would have had would have been a more circular kind of uh, thing for that thing. And uh, because my, father, my mother was writing a letter about the progress to her mother and complaining about how hard it was to get Schindler to focus, my grandfather took it upon himself to put my father's name, but not Schindler's, on the submission. And by the time the thing came, my father got wind of this. There were telegrams, what are you doing? This is impossible and so forth. But uh, uh, Schindler had a hard time believing that, that it wasn't that my father had done that to him. And that was really stuck in his craw, although after that, my father continued to work and they continued to work on projects together. But then, uh, after my father moved out, in, in particularly in 1932, when Schindler was not included in, in that thing, uh, not only was it a question of resentment about now my father's ascendancy, but there really was a philosophical difference between the two which is really interesting because they had almost identical education uh, within a year or two. I think Schindler was a senior when my father was a freshman or something of that amount of difference. And uh, it's this cheap and thin thing. 
understood that for Schindler, every project was a new artistic challenge. And for my father, it was more like industrial design. Everything was a case study for the next thing that would come along. And uh, it would be uh, done in a way that if he ever had a factory, it could be done in multiple copies. And uh, Schindler talks about uh, Gropius and Leutra and these other people who've been traumatized by the First World War and their father. This is engineering, this isn't architecture. So the fact that uh, this guy, the freshman who he'd helped to come over and now is getting so much attention in this thing that he disagreed with, stuck in his craw. And uh, it happened that uh, when I was in junior high school, my father had his second heart attack and ended up in Cedars Lebanon Hospital. And who should be there but Schindler at the end of his life with cancer? And so I remember my father, you know, the curtain would be pulled around and he would tell me not to talk about office stuff. Uh, while, while Schindler was there, not to make Schindler feel bad, but apparently they had a good time uh, together. Uh, at that, thinking about the old days with Lois and Barbara. I think Schindler was um, one of the great architects who didn't make a great success, and who lived under the Philip and Sir Johnson. Solution too. Right. And that was another blow. Uh, and I think he was probably more uh, of an introvert. Well, he was very extrovert in terms of business and life, but not a good marketer or business person at all. And um, it's interesting because now I think the interest in both Schindler and Neutra is, is has resurged. You know, well, I think Neutra has always been further than his artists have been affected. Well, we evaluating Schindler and the, the two of them because it was a rivalry between Frank Lloyd Wright and Schindler. Also, uh, <coughs> Wright dismissed him as being a good gardener. Right. And um, I, perhaps the testosterone of these men competing managed to um, uh, create, well, I think there's always <coughs> an ascendancy and an ability to work according to schedule and taking into account modern conditions and social social presentation. Um, but there's, there's a lot, are you, have you worked at all with Valentina Geneva? With Valentina that? Geneva. Did what she it? interview Valentina Geneva? No. She's making a full length feature film on Schindler. At the uh -huh. And she's been interviewing your brother and other, and Neutra plays a big role in this film. Right, uh -huh. yeah. and there's so another film by B.J. Lotovsky on yeah. my father, yeah. yeah. Um, we were talking over lunch about, uh, so both Schindler and my father went to work for Wright. Yeah. And then you ask, well, what resonated with them? And what is, what is influence about? What is the brain science of influence? about. In, in this book, I try to uh, uh, talk about and say that, you know, if usually art historians talk about it as if cop influence is copying. Uh, but I think uh, influence is stimulating something uh, and bringing out some in inherent capability. Uh, I, I suppose some people are influenced just purely copying. But uh, other people uh, <coughs> like Schindler and, and Neutra are stimulated, admire, but are not, it, it's, it's not a copy. It's, it's a it's pulling out different things. And it's not only formal copying, there's copying in the style of, of production of the, de of the design process. There's influence in the relationship with clients and influence in the relationship of other architects. Uh, art, art 
uh, architectural historians treat architecture like they treat artists. Artists are by and large solitary producers, with the exception of, let's say, Michelangelo had a lot of people working on the Sistine Chapel other than him, but uh, architects, certainly my father, had other people involved. Schindler, not so much. He, he usually had a very small office, and oftentimes he was the only one. And as, as I understand it, uh, he was kind of improvising as he went along. While my father was obsessive about everything was detailed out, the, the detailed book, standard details that were used again and again, so that you didn't have to keep drawing them all the time. And so he would never more than nine people in that little residential office would, would churn out 20 houses a year. Um, and they were all individually designed. Um, while Schindler would, would be out there as a general contractor, and you could argue was more successful at having an economic house because he, he knew exactly you know how to how to get it done. But these neutral houses were all aimed to be doable by by robots in a factory, right? And and because they were so exact, in fact they were more expensive because it's gets more expensive to do all that stuff just right um, and have the planes meet each other rather than having molding to protect the little failures along the way. Yeah. I have a question. How do you think we can best uh, preserve his legacy, both in an academic environment and in practice, uh, not only preserve, but even continue to develop what should be interesting? So um, not being an architect, I'm just improvising here, but um, I was telling you both at lunch that my brother is, is planning to leave an endowment to the Neutra Institute, which will have a job of fostering that. And I think my father uh, would have wanted the past to be presented in a way that it challenges the future, that, that uh, if something didn't work in his work or would no longer work, take this thing of when we get to have 120 degrees temperature here in, in San Diego in another 50 years, we're not going to have sliding glass doors uh, opening up to it. Uh, so, so does that mean that, uh, you know, what, what is the response to that? Is, is there some way of capturing the phenomenology of that thing in a way that is compatible with the, the temperature. And um, um, I, I was saying that um, this thing, my dad wrote a lot about teamwork. Um, you know, if you look at the architectural magazines, it, 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 nothing about the dynamic. It, it's kind of a mystery to me why some firms like Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill continue to produce good buildings. That's quite a, a sociological accomplishment, it seems to me. As a physician who's used to working in, in teams, uh, of course, the, there's, there are some organiza medical organizations that consistently uh, perform well in, in the leadership of how to make that happen and draw on all the different types of brains that go into making that thing and making it rewarding for them is really interesting. So um, Marvin was saying that people don't talk enough about, well, how did this office really work? Um, there's a fellow named John Blanton who worked with my dad for 15 years and had a, a modest career of his own, which was not a modernist uh, career because his clients were not modernist, but there are certain elements uh, of that, uh, of, of the commitments in the Neutra office that he continued in another way. 
and I asked him whether he was suffering those 15 years that he that that he was made to be the master's pencil, as Wright said of himself in Lou Sullivan. And he said, no, because he was able to do all phases of architectural practice without worrying about the business. And uh, it was a challenge to figure out how the way this office would do something. And he could finally get to the place that he could bring a preliminary up to my dad's bedroom where all this stuff was, was bedded. And uh, uh, was proud when he said, good, go with it. Uh, and didn't have to correct too much. He had a funny story about one particular house in that little uh, cluster of Notre houses in Silver Lake. Uh, and the thing was pretty much finished. And my dad looked at it and said, but wait a second, why do you have the power drop here? The pole is down on the street here. And that wire is going to go right in front of the window. So uh, let's put a pole right at right angles so that when you're sitting in the thing, it's coming straight at you and you hardly see it. But then you have to have the parapet wall come out and meet that pole. And so, uh, you know, there was an example of somebody who'd gotten it, you know, was right in sync. And here was a, a, another little detail that made a big difference in, in both the inside view and the outside view of that. Uh, of that house. And so uh, doing some research of how a small office like that works and then comparing it to some, you know, there are different styles of successful practice in, in the human relations as part of that legacy. Yeah. Um, it's a little tangential, but you sort of for the uh, benefit of some of the students here, we're going to be going through the licensing process. Do you know anything about when you said that your dad got his license? What exactly they had to do? License? So I'm not sure what my dad had to do to be licensed in 19, would have been, it, it must have been about 1927 because Schindler and, or even 26 because Schindler and and uh, Neutra started trying to do, there, there was a whole design for the Civic Center in Richmond, California that, that Pierluigi Serrano came across the other day and sent me pictures of. Um, so all kinds of things that never got built. Um, so I don't know uh, what, what he had to do. But this business of hustling reminds me of a story that's vivid for me as a, I must have been about 14 or something, and my mother announced it's Easter vacation. We're going to take a road trip up the up the coast, up to Mendocino, because we've never been up there. So my dad and I and my my mom drove all the way up the coast. And I remember coming down the Cruz Rhododendron Park. Uh, uh, near a sea ranch there and all these rhododendrons were in flower and my dad had had a heart attack so he had a mash car where the seat went down and he would lie with his feet up there and he'd be sitting in the back working on stuff and we sat there just looking out of the back watching these clouds of rhododendrons coming down and uh, there was kind of silence after that. And then we drove on to another place in near Mendocino, and there was an amazing peninsula there. And my father, uh, as we drove by a convenience store out in the countryside, told my mother to stop and raced into this place, and then came out and went into the phone booth and started calling. And then he came out to the door and he said, well, Dion and where do you think we're going tonight? And my mother said, I don't know, Richard. where are we going tonight? He <laughs> said, we are going to Lake Tahoe, all the way from the coast over to Lake Tahoe. And he said, why, Richard, are we going to Lake Tahoe? And she had a sparkle in her eye. He said, because the Ford, um, Ford agencies are meeting there. <laughs> 
<laughs> he said, why do we care about the Ford agency? Because the man who owns that property owns the Ford agency, and we're going to have breakfast with him tomorrow morning. <laughs> and so off we drove up over uh, the, uh, you know, to Reading and then down the coast up to thing. And sure enough, he, he made a beeline to the conference center and looked at what all the board uh, agencies were going to talk about. And then he called up this guy and said that he was a famous architect and he wanted to have, he had a business proposition for this guy. And God didn't know who my dad was from Adam. My dad always had a little time cover and a uh, thing that he had in his wallet that he showed him and had a thing and he said, now look, we've got to develop this whole thing. Well, nothing came out of that. And for every one of those 300 projects, there had to be 10 of these hustles that, uh, that uh, uh, went to this It allowed this immigrant who had no academic, he, 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 had, he tried to have a course in 1930 uh, at USC, and if he got four students and he could have the course, there was no application, so it never happened. <laughs> he did teach at Cal Poly. He did teach life. at Cal Poly, yeah. You know, one of the, the interesting projects that never got built influenced California today Chavez Ravine, right? And the housing there, and then the repercussions from all of that and not being built. So it really influenced in various ways our housing problems. My brother Dion and I went to UCLA and looked at the plans a few years ago, and I'm not sure how well that would have worked. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to build these high-rise build, high buildings with, with limited things which would work well for middle-class elderly people, but maybe not so well for the Hispanic people that were living in little houses in Chavez Ravine. So uh, th that whole episode with, with Frank Wilkinson, who, who lived on the top floor of our uh, um, BDL, um, he took the Fifth Amendment. Um, let's see. The, the biggest tragedy was for the Chavez Ravine people who were all moved out of their houses and then Dodger Stadium was put in instead. Yeah. And I was intrigued by the image of the layer cake and also given your background, I was interested in this idea of you know, nature, physiology, well-being, and the built environment. Uh, so, and then you brought the example of the Persian lady who wants the McMansion. And would you say that we're living in an age where the top layer of the cake is becoming more important? And that's where all the problems come from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so part of part of our inheritance from the African belt is this this curiosity it served us well right i mean those bands of people can you imagine it they walked all the way to china and then they walked over the bering strait and within about two thousand years they walked all the way down to the bottom of chile so we're a restless curious uh, species and when you have more money than you know what to do with um what are you going to do uh, it, it requires a, a kind of restraint, um, which uh, um, when exterior circumstances force us into it, uh, we do that. There, there's a whole tradition in America with the Shakers and the Quakers and so forth of, of a spiritual simplicity, right? Um, and, and the Amish, and, and the Amish are the only society that I know of that vet the technology that they're going to adopt according to a, a fixed criteria. And the, the criteria is, is this going to enhance our ability to live a Christ-like life? 
And if you talk about the smartphone SX, the answer is no. Uh, and even the telephone is best kept in the barn where the Yankees can call in and leave their milk order, and then you go in and take it, write it down, and quickly put it down again, and get away from that and talk to people face to face. And the Amish give their teenagers a chance to do something called harumlaufen. They go into town, they get drunk, they sleep around, and then at the end of the year, they make a decision. Either they're going to come back or they're going to go away and there will be no more contact. And 80% of them choose to come back. So the Amish are multiplying. They're moving out into the Dakotas and so forth because they've used up all the land in Pennsylvania. It's a very interesting model, but uh, you almost have to have a kind of a religious constraint to, to contain a biological thing that was functional when we when you were just chipping arrowheads and and so forth but when you're making robots and stuff it's uh it's not much more dangerous right this restraint should be about civilization <laughs> yeah i really enjoyed your history of the sliding doors and i was wondering the pictures that you showed us were all kind of small social living spaces I was wondering if your father and your brother applied those same concepts of sliding doors to more private spaces in the house, like bathrooms or bedrooms. Uh -huh. Yes, um, there are examples of, um, of spaces that could be opened up or, or closed, uh, closed up using opaque doors. Right. Do you think they just maybe didn't take pictures of those for magazines in the 50s? Well, was I was thinking built. mostly of this, uh, of the glass doors. That, that's a good point. I probably should. And there are other examples. Um, uh, Maybeck has some really nice uh, sliding doors that, that separate different things. Even in that um, Christian science uh, church, there's spaces that open up with the sliding um, opaque glass and, and steel frame doors. I think it's a really interesting topic. But sometimes Next it's, it's common because the, between what was the dining space and even the kitchen, it's also there too. So right. There, there's a, um, a kind of a folding accordion door that opens to the kitchen. My dad tended to keep the kitchen separate from the rest of the house, and nowadays we like to open it up. And then I also wondered if you've seen any solutions to the sliding door problems that you mentioned. So global warming being one of them, and then the robbers and mosquitoes that are definitely problems in Southern California today. Uh -huh. So I don't know if you have looked into that or if people have come up with kind of innovative ways that you can open the house with those considerations. My guess is that we're going to go more into enclosed patios that have maybe clear story and some some intrusion of light uh, with, with a screen. Like one of the delights, even for a blind person, if you open up a door like that and you feel the breezes coming in and so forth, that when things become really hostile, uh, that won't be an option. Uh, but in terms of the bugs, sure, you could have screens and you could have the breeze without the bugs. Now with West Nile disease in California, it's, it's uh, something serious, right? I can speak to the, oh, the robbers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated and really love uh, your dad's work and the architecture. It was really enlightening. And I was um, delighted when I found we, we lived in Washington, D.C. We did one house there. Right, for the Browns. The Browns, yes. Uh -huh. and I, I met the Browns. I knocked on the door. Uh -huh. And uh, can you be there? I've taken lots of photographs of it. Yeah. With an incredible. So they started out as young journalists with very little money. Uh -huh. Apparently, they wrote for the school and they didn't have much money. And they built this magnificent house in Hopestead Valley. And I think there are screens. The doors, screens, the screens, the screens, that could be, yeah. Them. You would need it in Washington for sure. Yeah. And now they have this amazing art collection. Yes. Yeah. 
Clinic is one of the, talking about climate, you, I, I was fascinated with his use of exterior shades long ago before that's the best way to keep out the sun outside of the glass. And we don't see that much here yet. They put shades on the interior. Right, don't the make time, any sense. They don't make any sense. Yeah. And he has in the houses in Silverdeck have exterior shades and, and the courtyards are right. as you said very innovative and the um, I tried I designed a house in Morocco once and I was trying to open the house and the client said you cannot open the house because it's so hot. You have to have a small opening and then have all the openings come to an interior court, which has a vellum roof uh -huh. to keep out the sun. So I think you're right, that's the way we have to go here and have the smaller openings to the outside and larger ones to dealing with the sun and the temperature. My dad did a lot of, uh, did some work in, in Southeast Asia and um, in Venezuela and uh, um, learning from the experience of architects in different climates, I think is probably a good thing for architectural education.